thank you. God, we thank you even though we are sinners trying to get up, even though we have not done what you've called us to do, what you've created us to do. Yet, God, you still come and you raise us up. You still place us on solid ground. God, I thank you that we are saved by your grace and saved by your mercy and saved by your power and saved by your blood and saved by your love. God, we thank you. God, we come to you this morning wide open, ready for you to do some transformation on us. God, we come to you this morning asking that you would open our eyes and our ears and God, that you would sometimes shut our mouths so that we can experience all that you are and all that you have for us. And so this morning, there is somebody in this place who needs a word from you. God, I need a word from you. And so I'm asking that you would come and that you would come strong and that you remove any distraction, any frustration, any confusion about who you are so that we may experience you in truth and in life. We thank you. We worship you. We adore you. In Jesus' name we pray. Psalm 51 is written by King David. Who knows about King David? Anybody know about King David? I think more of you know about King David. Anybody else? King David's story in all of the Bible is one of the most intriguing, interesting, scary, wonderful stories in the Bible. I mean, he is quite a guy. He's quite a guy. Earlier at 8 o'clock, Richard talked about Empire. Does anybody want to admit that they watch Empire? There you go. Empire, and how the story is so um, messy, and it's so good, and it has so many twists and turns, you don't know what's going to happen. There's murder and, and all kind of just craziness going on, and every week you watch, you go, what madness will they come up with next? Guess what? That's already been done, and it started with David. David's story is like this. When you read about David, you wonder, what is this man going to do next? And so we find David right now talking to the prophet Nathan. And David has done some real griminess up until this point. David um, has slept with somebody else's wife. This is the part where you say, okay, I need drama, y'all. Y'all get, I need drama, okay? So David has slept with somebody else's wife. I love it. I love it. Because you know that's what you do when you watch a good show, right? You, oh, I talk back to the TV. Move, lady, run, no. David saw this wonderful, this beautiful woman on a terrace uh, next to his. Her name was Bathsheba. He sees Bathsheba, and he just has to have Bathsheba. I mean, he really, really will do whatever it takes. The only problem is Bathsheba just so happens to be the wife of Uriah. Yes, I know. Now, Uriah is uh, one of David's uh, best soldiers. He's one of David's best warriors. He has been faithful to David, but David is, that's all out of David's mind right now. He just sees Bathsheba on this terrace. I don't care about Uriah. I don't care about the fact that I'm the king. I want her. And so as David does, he gets what he wants. And he goes, that's what I'm talking about. He goes, he gets Bathsheba, he sleeps with Bathsheba, and Bathsheba gets pregnant. I knew it. And you knew it was coming, right? She gets pregnant and David panics. Oh boy, what do I do now? What do I do now? And instead of going to God immediately, he decides to come up with a plan. Comes up with a plan. I know what I'll do. I'll get Uriah killed. I'll get him killed. Oh, I know. Yeah, I'm going to get Uriah killed. Um, And then nobody will ever know that, that I slept with her. It'll look like He slept with her. But before I kill him, maybe I'll try something different. When he comes from the battleground, I'll just tell him, I'm the king, he'll do what I say. I'll just tell him, go sleep with your wife. And then she'll get pregnant and it'll look like his baby. That's a good twist, isn't it? Uriah comes back and David says, oh, I know you are tired and missed your woman. Go, go, be with your wife. And Uriah says, but sir, my men are still fighting. I can't go while my men are still on the battleground. David goes, oh, Uriah. 
Uriah. Your good heart. Ugh. Okay, um, no, but you're right. You've worked so hard. Please, please go be, be with your wife. And he says, I hear you, king, but I can't do it while my men are still fighting. And David says, oh, okay. Take this note to the general on the front lines. Takes him a note that says, just put him out there. Put Uriah right on the front and make sure he don't come back. Make sure that he dies. He's plotted. He's planned. His scheme is going to work, and then Nathan the prophet shows up and goes, I know your dirty little secret. I know what you've been up to, and David panics. David goes into this uh, whirlwind of confusion and confession. This is a man who loved God. This is a man who sought after God's heart. He was a man after God's own heart, and here he was at the ultimate betrayal of God, and it shook his very foundation. David. This is David's, David's confession of sin. It's a shock because in ancient times, kings didn't really tell you all their messiness. And let's be true, in modern times, our politicians don't tell us their messiness either. Most of the time, people in high rank don't come to press conferences and say, uh, let me tell you about this week's sins. Let me tell you about how I stole the money or played this part or did this. That doesn't really happen a whole lot. And if it does, then it's surrounded by so much fluff, we never really hear the confession. So this is shocking that David in this time would speak so honestly and clearly to God and say to God, I have messed up. Not only did he say it, but he wrote a song about it. Now, if you're an R&B head like some folks in here, maybe you know about some artists who have sung about confessions. Anybody know Usher? Yeah, right. He, he had a little confession going on or something real twisted. R. Kelly trapped in the closet. It's 33 chapters of a soap opera where he confesses all kind of craziness. I mean, that's crazy, and, but this is different. This one is focused on God's unfailing love for David. On one hand, David knows so deep in his heart that God loves and forgives, but on the other hand, he knows that he is full of shame and full of sin, and how could he come before this God of great forgiveness and great overwhelming compassion? How could he, what could he offer this God? David makes it plain. David makes it real. He expresses this obsession with this situation. Um, have you ever been in, in, a, in a situation where you just couldn't get something off your mind? Uh, you don't have to outwardly admit it to the whole crowd today. But maybe uh, you've been in a, in, in a situation where you've done something wrong, where you've messed up, where you've screwed up, where we've sinned. We've done something against God, and it just stays right on your mind. David said, it stays ever before me. He said, I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. It haunts him in his sleep. It follows him every day. There are, I imagine, certain triggers that, uh, that don't help David out. Maybe every time he sees a bathtub, he remembers a Bathsheba on that terrace in the tub, and he goes, oh, that's where it all started. Maybe every time he sees a soldier, he remembers Uriah. Maybe every time he smells a certain incense in the air, he remembers the night where he betrayed not only Uriah, but he betrayed God. Maybe there were some triggers that continue to haunt David. David wasn't doing well in his heart. His heart beat, uh, beats the very betrayal that he had set forth, the schemes he planned, the sin he did, the wrongdoing. He orchestrated, but mostly David's heart felt the dishonor that he brought God. God, this God, the very God who put David in the position he was in. This God who took David as a scrawny little kid, um, playing with some sheep out in a field and said, I'm going to make you a hero. The same David who said, you are unqualified and insignificant, but I'm going to make you one of the greatest kings in the Bible. This God is the God that David has betrayed. And this is the God that David goes to and lays it all down. I've messed up. I've screwed up and I need to be clean, cleaned out. I need for that joy. I need for that joy to be back in my heart, to be brought back into my life. David pleads for the spirit to be sustained inside of him. He wanted to just get back on his feet again. He wanted to be clean. He wanted to get rid of this feeling of deep disappointment and discouragement. He needed to be lifted. He had a hard time believing that he messed up, though. That's kind of like us, right? I have a hard time. He's thinking, how did I get here? I'm King David. King David. I don't mess up. People sing songs about me. 
They say, David has killed tens of thousands. I am David. I am the standard. I am what people look at. Uh, But here I am, guilty and ashamed and dirty and lost. And I need you, God. I need you to clean me up. I need you to watch me. I need you to hear me. I need you to blot out all my sins. God, restore me, renew me. I need a life do-over. Here I am, God, David says, pouring out all this junk and all this mess to you. I'm praying that you just won't give up on me. I'm praying that you just don't leave me. God created me a clean heart. If we are honest with ourselves this morning, we've all been there, right? If you don't, you don't have to nod, it's okay. I know because I've been there. On your knees, praying, how did I get here? What was I thinking? I'm Akilah. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm, 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 I'm this daughter, this person's daughter, this person's son. I'm in this position. What did I do? What was I thinking? Feeling so ashamed and so full of guilt, and here I am on my knees confessing it all. Asking you, God, to help me out. Sometimes it happens in the quiet of our prayers, and sometimes it happens in the muffled, smuggled tears in our pillows. Sometimes we ignore it, don't we? We say, "Mm, I'm not even going to touch that. It's so bad. It hurts so bad. It doesn't make sense. I'm just going to let it go. But God knows our hearts, and God knows whether we speak it or we don't speak it. Sin is serious. And God takes sin seriously. We have to realize that our sinful actions and sinful dispositions is who we are. We can try to run from it. We can try to hide, but it's always going to be there. Have you ever said, this is the last time. If you would just save me this time, I won't do it again. And then we do it again and go, okay, really? See, that last time was just the the pre last time. This is really the last, last time. And then you find yourself even a couple of years later saying, okay, see, I wasn't mature enough then, but now I understand why. Over and over and over and over and over again, it happens. It creeps in slow sometimes, slow and quiet and smooth, but sometimes it comes in like a roaring lion and it takes us over. We don't want to sometimes, but we do it anyway. And sometimes it gets to us like it got to David. And we find ourselves in this haunting situation where things trigger us and set us off. Maybe it's a song on the radio. Maybe it's the smell of a certain perfume or the click of computer keys. Sometimes the harder we run from it, the faster it chases behind us. And we say to ourselves, I am so ashamed. I am so guilty. I am so dirty. I am so lost. I need you, God. I need you to clean me up, to wash me. God, would you just hear me? Blot out my sins, sir. Something else around me. Create something new. Restore me. Renew me. I need a life do-over. Here I am pouring out all of my stuff, all of my mess, just asking you to don't leave me here alone. God created me a clean heart so that I can serve you, so that I can follow you. As I reflect on the sermon so far, I am reminded of two affirmations from the Word of God. First, that there is therefore now no condemnation. And second, that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's tune in and hear how we can move from confession to cleansing. I don't know where you are in this season of your life. I don't know what kind of Lenten journey you've been on, but I can imagine that all of us have some wounds and all of us have some gaps and some holes where sin has and is creeping in. Maybe it gets worse the further you push it aside. Maybe it gets worse the, for, the more you pull it in. But may I suggest to you that you are uncomfortable and that you're in this season because God is in the process of cleaning you up. May I suggest to you that maybe you're at the beginning of the process where God can start pulling out some grime and some dirt and some yucky so that he can get us to a place where he wants us to be, so that we don't spend our days wondering, how did I get here? What did I do? 
Let me drop this little something into your spirit. Maybe God is creating room for you to bring that joy back and to have a restored life. Maybe you've lost all hope and you fear that you're going to be down forever. Maybe you're down. Maybe you're crawling and crying, and we can't see it on the inside because from here, everybody looks actually really good. But maybe there's something so deep underneath all the beauty products and, and, and wonderfulness that we see on the outside. Maybe there's something on the inside. Let me offer you this glimmer of a nugget of God that God is still a God of forgiveness, and God is still a God of hope. And that even if you're down, you can get back up again. That song was more than just a song. It's a reality that you don't have to stay down just because you're down there, but that God can raise you up. St. Peter of Damascus said this, should we fall, we should not despair. And so estrange ourselves from the love, the Lord's love. Let us always be ready to make a new start. If you fall, rise up. If you fall again, rise up again. This beautiful song of confession and cleansing and prayer and praise and disappointment and joy from David helps us to see that our hearts, if our hearts would just open up for a minute, that God can reach inside and change some things so that we can get off of our knees so that we can stop crawling and stop uh, pulling our way through the dirt and the grime. With eyes filled with tears, we can confess our sins to God, and he won't strike us down. That if we would just open up and be honest to God, about who we are and where we are, he can do something good. That we would set aside the fact that we think we're so holy and so good and so righteous and so honorable and be humble enough to come to the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, here I am. What will God do for us? We will sin again. Guess what? No big surprise. It will happen again. We will fall again. We will come crawling back again. And every single time, God will be there. God will be there to wash us up and pick us up and stand with us and set us forth. And sometimes he'll be there to pull us back and sit us down and shut us up. But no matter what he does, he will always be right there. David. David offered this broken heart to a healing God. What do you offer today? What do you offer today? What am I offering today? David asked for restoration of his soul, of his spirit, so that he can sustain this journey. What do you need to go on in this journey? David laid down all of his mess before the very feet of Jesus and declared his own sin and his shortcoming. What do you need to lay down today? What do I need to lay down today? If you want to get back up again, there's a way, and it starts with confession. There is a process, and it starts with us being honest and being open and not being afraid that God's going to turn it into something weird. That's not the God we serve. The God we serve is a God of forgiveness when we come to him honestly and openly. You can have another chance. You can experience God's joy. You can feel the Spirit changing something inside of you, and it can start today. It can start with the simple, open, honest, real, authentic act of confession. It has to start with confession because that's how cleansing happens. And at some point when God starts to work on us and clean us out, when he fixes our heart, we can be used by him. We can be used by him. That's what all of this is about. It's not so much that I can have a clean heart and then I look good and I feel good and I feel healthy and strong. It's so that we can serve him later, so that when we see somebody else who's down, we can go and pull them up. So when they get up and I'm down again, they can pull me up or they can say, together, let's go pull her up or let's go pull him up. It's not about us. It begins with confession. It moves to cleansing and then it moves to serving. That's what we are here for. Lord, give me a clean heart so that I may serve thee. Lord, fix my heart so that I may be used by you. For I'm not worthy of all your blessings. Give me a clean heart so that I'll follow you. We are not worthy. We are not worthy of the goodness that God bestows on us every single breath we take. We're not worthy of it, but he does it anyway. 
We're not worthy of his love and his abundance, but he does it anyway. And so why wouldn't we open up to him? Why wouldn't we tell him everything, everything so that he can clean us up? This morning, I do want to do an altar call. I want to do it a little differently than we've done before. Um, Usually we come to the offer and then everybody turns this way and everybody who remains seated can see what's going on. I want to do something different. I want us to actually come to the cross this morning so that when you come up, don't turn that way, but focus your attention here so that we are reminded that this is where we should always come, that this is the place where real cleansing happens. This is the place where, where real restoration happens. This is the place where, where real love happens. This is the place where real sacrifice happens. This is the place that you come, not on the gossip hotline. Not in the beauty salon or the barber shop. Not even though you might have the best, best friend in the whole planet or the best husband or the best wife or the best mother or the best grandmother or the best uncle. That is awesome. But this is the place where real stuff happens, real transformation. And so uh, we're going to sing a really beautiful song and we'll make it personal. But if you feel the spirit leading you, come to the cross. You don't have to touch anybody. You don't have to hold anybody's hand. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do. But if you want to start the process of confession today, let's start focused on the cross. If you are watching on YouTube and you're watching this at home or at work, maybe there's no cross for you to come to. But you can picture the cross in your mind and picture coming to Jesus. Picture coming right to his feet and confessing all that you are and all that you have. So this is for everybody this morning. And let's begin by singing a beautiful song, Give Me a Clean Heart. Let's pray. God, we open this altar for your sons and your daughters. God, you know the weight and the heaviness that lays on their shoulders, that holds their hearts. God, I pray that someone who has been praying a long time can make this act, can make this walk, Lord, and come to you. And so, God, we open this moment for whatever you have for us today. We're asking that you would have your way, God and that we would let go of our own agendas and our own ego and our own stuff and just come to you. God, maybe we want to kneel at the cross. I don't know. Maybe we want to lift our hands. I don't, I don't know. But God, we thank you. We thank you for a moment to just be with you. The altar is now open. What an amazing service. What was your favorite part, Candace? It really was an amazing service, Danielle. Such an affirmation of God's love for us. I think my favorite part was just this idea that we can mess up so many times, but as long as we confess our sins to God, he'll give us a clean heart. You're so right. It's such a blessing to be part of this church. Thank you so much for tuning in. Remember, our services are every Sunday, 8 and 10 a.m. You can continue to tune in with us here, or you can come to our church at 89.60, 164th Street in Jamaica, New York. Be blessed.